India, girls are not equal to boys. Girls are expected to have children and take care of the family. My mother was married at 12. She gave birth to seven children. Two died before their second birthday. So growing up, I was the eldest of the five. I was enrolled in school. But I didn't go regularly. Then my mom got really sick. There was no money for a school. I cleaned seven houses to support my family. I didn't want a life like my mom. So I was determined to go to school. I remembered a friend telling me about a school where the fees were not very much. That's when I found Prerna. My school not only gave me an education, it made me self-reliant. My life is very different from my mom's. Now I have a good job so I can support my family. I even purchased a plot of land that I plan to build a house on someday. My name is Kiran Sahu and I am 10th grade at Prerna Girls School. I played Lakshmi Nishad in the film. When we were making the film you just saw, I did not feel like I was acting. I feel like it was my own life. I also lost a parent. In my case, it was my father. Who cannot, I have a brother who cannot stand to see me to go to school. He burned my books, uniform when I was 13, and he pulled me out of school five times. But my mother always with me and supporting me. And today, I can proudly say that, much like Lakshmi Didi, I am the most educated person in my family. <laughs> to most people, Prerna is just a school, but for me, it has been a home. Every time I forced to leave, they always took me back. In Prerna, I have safe space to talk about myself, my life, my problems, my world in my place in it. I had never talked with anyone about these things before, not even my mother. My teachers are caring. They listen to me and support me. And this has given me courage and confidence to take control and change my life. Now, I make my own decision. Prerna also... <laughs> Prerna also helped me realize that I can be anything I want to be. Education has changed my life. I believe that all girls should fight to get an education and every school should be like a prerna and support girls. Prerna has given me a dream to be a police officer. And I prove that my brother can run the world, that girls can run the world. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lakshmi Nishad, and I graduated from Prerna Girls in 2012. This film makes, makes, makes me look my, sorry, this film makes me look my life with fondness and pain. Today I want to share what kept me going. Many girls in my neighborhood did not go to school. I was almost the, one of them. But even the girl who did not end up, like me, 
The difference was my school, Prerna. Unlike others, my school cared for me. They cared if I was happy, if I was fed. Even after losing my mother at 13, I had a mother in each one of my teacher, and most of all in Rishi Auntie, who was my mentor and the leader of the Study Hall Education Foundation, which support young women like me. At the school, I was given respect. I learned that my words carry meaning and power. So education did change my life, but not in the traditional sense. It was the kind of education that Prerna gave me truly transformed me. While my father sold my books to buy alcohol, my school taught me to respect myself and fight for my life. It taught me to deserve a home, and I have a right to it. I see Kiran. I see how my sister's life is so different from mine. They all have an education. I see Kiran. She facing similar struggles, but with more, also with more aspiration and strength. And I agree to share my story with everyone, not because I feel that it is unique, but sadly, because it is not. I hope that my story will give strength to girls around the world. Good morning. I'm Urvashi Sahni, the founder of Study Hall Education Foundation and the Prerna School. I didn't want to be a girl when I was growing up, and neither did many girls, and it's not hard to see why. In India, most many girls do not feel safe, wanted, free, or equal. Nearly a million girls killed in the womb due to sex-selective sex abortions, high rates of domestic violence, four rapes an hour, and one-third of the world's child brides, let's call them girl slaves, are in India. You know, like everyone else, I believe that education is the solution, which is why I founded the Study Hall Education Foundation and Prerna School. But I learned in my work with Prerna that though education is a very powerful social and personally transformative force, it's not just any kind of education. Education, to be transformative, must be transformed. We learned in Prerna that if school is to change girls' lives, then it must provide a safe, caring space, and it must teach girls lessons of equality along with lessons of math and science. We teach our girls that they are equal persons, deserving respect, and they have the right to a life of their own choosing and thriving. And it is with these lessons that you can see that they have navigated, negotiated, and forged a pathway for themselves and their families, families through a very inhospitable and challenging social terrain. We also teach our boys, we started working with them recently, the same lessons of equality. That though patriarchy is not their fault, it does give them more power and privilege. And it is very cruel to their sisters, their mothers, and all the women that they care about. So we teach them. <laughs> a different way of being good men. And they are working alongside their sisters supporting them and fighting for their rights with them. We are thrilled to be a part of the Global Girls Alliance, and I know that our teachers, boys and girls, together, we will build a beautiful, just, fair, peace and peaceful and loving world. Thank you. Please welcome your host, Obama Foundation Museum Director, Louise Bernard. Next slide, please. <laughs> good morning, everyone. I said good morning, everyone. And hello, friends on live stream. Let's give Laxmi, Kiran, and Avashi another round of applause.
These are just three stories coming out of the Global Girls Alliance, which we'll hear a bit more about later. My name is Louise Bernard. I'm the director of the Museum of the Obama Presidential Center. That means it's my job to help tell the story of the Obama presidency. And what a story to help tell. Every American presidency has a remarkably complex legacy, an imprint that reaches much further than the walls of the White House or the pages of history. That imprint lives in the documents and the artifacts that record history. But it also lives, it exists in the memories and the lived experiences of the people that presidency reached. In Barack Obama's case, his legacy was far more complex. He was both president and pioneer, our first African-American president in a country that has long attempted to deny African-Americans their dignity. All of us here in this room and many more watching online were drawn to this gathering because of President Obama either inspired by his historic rise to the White House or empowered by the work of the Obama Foundation. And before we believed in the president, we believed in his story. We believed in the story of a young man with roots in Kansas and Kenya. We believed that someone with two legacies could help bridge our divides. And we believed in the hope he offered that we could change history. Storytelling has always been at the heart of humankind. We are storytelling animals, be it around campfires, in the passing down of oral tradition, or on the pages and screens that now convey our most engaging tales. Storytelling has also been at the heart of human progress. It's the stories we tell about ourselves, about our desire for something greater, that equip us to dream big, that inspire us to do more, that give us the hope that history can change. In this morning's session, we're going to hear from some of the world's leading artists, writers, and communicators, as well as some powerful emerging voices about how storytelling can stoke our imaginations and fuel our ambitions for a better world. Our first conversation is between an unlikely but compelling pair, Terry Westover is a historian and the author of Educated, a memoir, which is a runaway New York Times bestseller. Kamara Brown is a psychotherapist and the beloved reality show star on the Emmy award-winning Netflix reboot of Queer Eye. <laughs> Give it up for Tara and Karama. Together, they're going to explore the healing power of narrative. But before we bring them to the stage, we have a special message from someone who wishes she could be here. I'm so sorry I can't be there with you in person, but I'm thrilled that so many of you are coming together in my hometown for our second summit. For me, Chicago is the place where I first learned to dream. I was raised not far from here on the South Side, as many of you know. In high school, I learned the rhythm and the pace of this city on my morning bus rides across town. And when I returned here after getting my education, I took a leap of faith and began a lifetime of public service. So this city is the place where I first learned about the kind of impact I could have on the world around me. But it's not just me. Chicago is a city where anyone can both feel at home and feel like they're a part of something larger than themselves. That's the spirit Barack and I hope to build on with our foundation. And that's why we chose to root it right here in the city that has given us so much. We want to create a place where the community can gather, a place where young people can acquire the skills and the connections they need to match their aspirations with real opportunities a place that encourages and emboldens a generation of new leaders in Chicago and beyond. And we want to reach out from our hometown to make an impact for people around the country and around the world. That's why we recently launched the Global Girls Alliance, the effort you heard about earlier to help adolescent girls get the education they deserve. See, right now, there are 98 million adolescent girls around the world who are not in school. 
These girls are bright and hardworking, trust me. They have so much potential. And when they have the chance to fulfill that potential by getting an education, they can transform families, communities, even entire countries. So we're rallying support and funding for organizations already working on the ground to get more girls in school. And we're doing everything we can to connect people here in Chicago and across the country with the cause of global girls' education. Because that's what this city taught me. Whether I was a young girl with big dreams or a young professional trying to make a difference, that real change starts with each one of us doing our part, not just for ourselves, but for our families and our communities and the world around us. So I want to thank you all, all the organizers, all the young people, all our donors. Thank you for living out the common hope that ties together our uncommon stories. Thank you for everything you're doing here at this summit. But more than that, for all that you do in the months and years after you leave. Please welcome host of Queer Eye, Karamu Brown, and author Tara Westover. Hello? Can you hear me? There we go. Hi, friends. How are you all doing today? Good. I'm so excited to be with you all. Tara, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm extraordinary. Thank you. Um, I come from the Black Southern Church, so when we come into congregation, we like to first of all tell people to turn to your neighbor and say, good morning. I see you. I will hear you. And I love you. It's nice just to set the intention, right? Um, I'm very excited to be sitting down with Tara right now. This is probably one of the most special moments for me. I know they said an unlikely pair, but I actually think <laughs> this is pretty likely of a pair that could speak. Um, our, both of our stories are both uncommon to some degree of how we have made it through these traumatic moments and have turned it into stories of success, of love, of empathy, of all the things that are great about this world. And I think in a time when we feel so polarized, where it seems like no one is listening to each other, when we feel like we're on different sides and no one is really hearing each other, I think what is special about this conversation that I hope that we're gonna have is that we're gonna be able to share how we use our uncommon stories in order to connect with other people who have different beliefs than us. You agree? Sounds like an ambitious goal, but I support it. <laughs> <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> so the first question I have for you is your story. Does everyone know Tara's story? <laughs> oh, well, let's start there. First of all, let's start there. Uh, let's, Cliff Notes, I guess, is I was raised by survivalists in the mountains of Idaho. My parents were opposed to a lot of institutions most people take for granted, but the big ones were the medical establishment and school. So I was never put in school. And when I was 16, I decided to educate myself. I went to university and for 10 years, that's what I did. I went to school, I got a PhD. But because my family was a bit radical, the end result of that would be I would, I would, I would move more into the mainstream and they would become more radical and there would be a, a choice essentially that would emerge out of that where I would have to weigh this obligation. What do I owe to my family? And what do I owe to myself? And the end result of that would be I would be estranged from some of my family. And that's not a super common story, I don't think. I mean, my family are radical. They're different. Most people here weren't raised like that. But I do think a lot of people do have to make that choice. I know you do a lot of work with LBGTQ youth, and I think that central conflict with family, what do I owe to my family? What do I owe to myself? Is something I think a lot of them face as well, and it's not for the reasons that I faced it, but it is the same choice. Yeah, can we all write that down? Are we taking notes? What do I owe myself, and what do I owe my family? And when I say family as well, it could also be used in the sense of what do I owe my community? What do I owe my world? Because I think that internal conflict is the first conflict that we all experience so that we can then have the, be in the space to connect with other people. So hearing your story, I mean, most people would have said, I'm not gonna be able to find love and empathy in having someone 
love and empathy for myself, first of all, but then also still finding love and empathy for my family. How did you find a space to use your story to still connect with them and find love and um, empathy for them? And I, I think forgiveness is something that you do not for other people. I think it's something you do for yourself. And you do it because it's not nice to live with anger. And, and I think, actually, I think anger can be good. I think it can serve a purpose. I think it can be used to get you out of situations that are harmful to you. Once you're out, though, I tend to think you can let go of it and just live a better life without it. So I try to think of anger in a, in a kind of meta way. I try to step outside of it and say, why am I... Why am I angry and is this feeling useful to me? Is it sometimes when you're full of rage, it actually just makes you, uh, it actually kind of neutralizes you. It makes you unable to think strategically. So is that what's happening? And um, I mean, I thought you must have had experiences with this where on the show, you have to connect with people that are so different from you. And how do you uh, approach that? And how does, what's the role that maybe your own views and your own frustrations and your own um, things that you believe in maybe aren't represented by these people and then you have to find a way to, to make that relationship fruitful and empathetic. And Yeah. You know, being on Queer Eye, if any of you haven't seen it, it's about five gay men that will walk into homes of individuals who, has, who generally you would assume would not be accepting of five gay men from different diverse backgrounds. And our job there is to connect with them, but also is to help them become their best selves. And there have been many opportunities where we are in spaces where immediately I feel triggered. Yeah. And I think a lot of us in this room can exper experience that day in and day out just by the alerts we are constantly getting on our phone. We feel as if who I am as a woman as a person of color, as a person of a different gender, gender orientation, sexual orientation, or gender expression, sexual orientation, that somehow I am not of value, of somehow that I do not belong, that I am sort of on the outskirts. And we walk into spaces with that trauma. Yeah. And for me, when I'm on Queer Eye, the first thing I do is to check that trauma at the door. I check it at the door. I say, what is gonna be my intention in this space? If I walk in with all the trauma and triggers I have, then I'm never going to be able to lean in, listen, and learn. And I think those are the main things. I lean into my fears of the labels that these individuals hold and what, how those labels trigger me. You know, we hear certain words that people, labels people put on us. And for me, I look at those and I say, okay, that label might trigger me, that label might trigger me, but I'm going to lean into that fear and ask myself, what could happen? What's the worst that could happen if I'm able to actually be open about my fear that that label comes with? I think it's one of the things I really value about the show, or it's kind of shocking, actually. I didn't realize, you know, we are, as a, as a country, mm -hmm. self-segregating in all kinds of ways. Oh like, gosh, we live with people who are like us, either in the kind of jobs that they have or the kind of beliefs that they have or ethnically, we're all just self-segregating. And it, it's so unusual to see people of real difference in close quarters together. And I think that's one of the things that is so amazing about the show is the jarring quality of yeah, having these five gay men march into a a more traditional setting, shall we say, and, and just feeling how uncomfortable that is and then feeling how quickly that dissipates. Because at the end of the day, as you know, it's all about love. That's what yeah. we all want. We want love, we want support, we want empathy. And it's about how do we encourage somebody to grow through whatever ignorance we feel they have so that they can understand the love and the empathy that we all desire. And you do that very well in your own life. How have you noticed that your stories, your personal story and sharing it has helped people to grow through the feelings that they might have had? I think that, I think people want to believe that they can change. I mean, I write about education. I try to, about, I try to write about education not just as making a living, getting a better job, but as all the ways that it, it changed me as a person. It made me a completely, different person and I think everyone, I hope at least, that people can identify with that, that journey, that journey of change. But as I was saying a minute ago, sometimes when you change, the people in your life might not accept that change or 
or, you know, I think in the case of LBGTQ issues, it's not a change, it's who you are, and sometimes it's hard for people to accept. So I think that in that way, I, I hope that people are able to find value in the story. But I also, I also tend to think, I mean, my family are very radical, they hold a lot of views that most people would, would find to be uh, pretty abhorrent, actually. But I tend to, I mean, I, I think that they're, they're just people, and I, I tend to think everyone is just people. I think we're all kind of the same. I don't, I don't actually think that there's a racist gene or a homophobic gene or a sexist gene. I think people have the beliefs they have because of the experiences that they've had. Of course. And I have to believe that because I've had all of those views at a point in my life. For the way I was raised, I, I believed some pretty shocking things. And my, my, my ideas changed because my experiences changed. And I, I just think everybody wants... Dignity, that's what people want. And they want it as, as whatever life they're living in whatever way they're living it. We just, everybody wants that sense of respect. Yeah, completely. You know what, I, I think about it now. You didn't have any form of education or experience until you were 17. So you didn't know about the Holocaust. No. You didn't know about the civil rights movement. How do you feel not having that information has now shaped you as an adult? Do you think it has now, do you think that the reason that we are so divided when it comes to our stories is because people aren't educating themselves? Or do you feel like the education that people are receiving is what's helping them to be more divided? Well, I think our education, you know, for one thing, education is not the same thing as a school. So there's education is this idea, it's this abstract idea, I think, that has to do with self-discovery and with learning and discovering who you are and what the world is. But schools, again, they tend to be geographically located. They tend to be, uh, I think certain narratives prevail. So I think sometimes, especially with, if we're talking about, whether we're talking about race or gender, whatever division you want to pick, I think it's not so much that people don't know the history, although that's probably part of it, but we actually know different histories. Like we are told different stories, I think, and the way that we remember the past, if you're a part of one community, is, is not the same as, as what you remember if you're from a different community. I was raised in a state of kind of total ignorance of any of this, and I learned about the civil rights movement in college, one of my first classes I went, and total blank slate, walked in, the professor starts talking about Rosa Parks. And I had never heard any of this. And so when he says, when he said that she was arrested for, st for taking a seat on a bus, I thought he meant that she'd stolen the bus. That makes <laughs> like, sense. I just, it was the <laughs> only way that I could make sense. I, it was like a really mis unfortunate misunderstanding of, you know, take a seat yeah. versus to take a seat. Yeah. And so I was like, how did she? I've never thought of that. I was like, how did she get it loose? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, how did she? And then I was like, what did she want with it anyway? This like tiny woman and she's going to carry this bus seat. I was like, that's the worst crime I've ever yeah. heard. Because it just, there was no space in my head for the idea that there would be a time in the country where you could arrest someone for sitting in a certain place. And I was just like, that doesn't, that she was stealing the seat made way more sense. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, completely. Way more sense. And so that was, so he was trying to explain that and I didn't get it at all. And then, and then the story moved on to Emmett Till. And I think what surprises me now as I think about the civil rights movement and what his, the best historians of the civil rights movement talk about how there are certain stories that persist from that in the white community that are probably different from the ones. Like in some ways, it's a lot more comfortable for for, uh, I, th I think, for most Americans to think of Rosa Parks, because it's kind of a nicer story, rather than something that is so awful and so difficult yes. like Emmett Till. And so I kind of think, I had this particular experience where I didn't know about anything, and I, I had my world made for me by the people I grew up with, and so in my world, there was no civil rights movement. That had never been a thing. But I kind of think everyone has this to some degree. The stories that make it to us are largely curated for us by other people. Of course. I've talked to people who had a... <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I've spoken to people who had a mainstream education in this country who um, I've said to them about redlining, uh, and they had no idea what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. They just had not learned that. So I think that there is something to be said for stepping outside of your comfort zone, recognizing whatever community you're a part of, 
people are going to curate certain stories for you that are going to represent your view of the world, and that's what's going to be put in front of you, even if you go to a school. And the trick is to step outside of that. And education should always be, I think, a little bit of a revolution, a little bit of reading things you're not quite supposed to read yeah. that don't quite represent what the people, well-meaning, are, are trying to make you into. And I think for me, that was something I had to kind of grapple with. Was It wasn't just that I had learned a specific version of, 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 of American history because I hadn't learned anything about the civil rights movement. Everybody Everybody learns a specific version of everything. Mm -hmm. And the trick is to try to get outside of that. Well, I think you're right about that. It's perspective. And I think that's what we all need to really realize is that this perspective, perspectives that we have and why it's so important that we all don't, we all share every part of our stories. Like checking any part of your identity is what will stop us from growing and coming together. You know, there's a term that some of you in here may know called code switching. Have you ever heard of that term? No. Yeah, y'all know about code switching. Okay, some of you do. So code switching is where you go into certain spaces, predominantly people of certain um, of color or people of different um, gender identities or expressions, sexual orientations. They'll go into a space and they'll leave certain parts of their identity and start acting a certain way in that space to feel accepted, hmm. to feel as if I belong here or to feel like maybe now I can get this opportunity. But the problem with that is that when you leave your perspective and you leave who you are at the door, the other person no longer has an opportunity to grow. And I think that's the thing we need to realize, is that when someone doesn't have an opportunity to grow, it's when we become more disconnected than ever. And so to hear you talk about education in that way, it's so important because we are fed certain perspectives. People tell us one story, but we have the power to challenge that story when we show up with our full identities. When I show up and say, I'm a black man, I'm a gay man, I'm a Christian man, I'm the son of immigrant parents, I am an educated man, I am all of these things, and none of them, I'm a father, all of these things make me who I am and have informed how I walk through this world. And when I share those perspectives with someone else is when they have an opportunity to understand and empathetically listen to why their choices may hurt me. And I think that's the beauty about what our stories do for other people, is that sometimes we are scared, like you said, education should be radical. You should read things that you would normally not read or listen to. But at the same rate, you should also talk to people and share your story with people you are nervous to talk to, with people who you perceive to be different than you. Well, it's like what you said when you're thinking, what is the worst thing that could happen? And I think that is, as I was saying, what's so great about the show is that you, there's just tension when you walk into a place that is not obvious that you would be. And then in the end, it is okay. Yeah. It's always okay. And uh, I don't know, I think education should be uncomfortable. My education was super uncomfortable uh, in, a, in, in a lot of ways, and I think that is what distinguishes it from propaganda. If you're just taking, you go to a school and they tell you this is what history is, and this is what happened, and these are the stories that we care about, and these are the stories that we don't, that really is propaganda. Yeah. And it, it really is only when you start reading the things that are a little bit outside of that box and it can be incredibly uncomfortable i think and it but i i, I think you're, you're so much better is not just formal education i mean exactly. you and i both have formal educations but i think it's important for people to understand who are listening in this room and outside of this room that education comes in your everyday life you're learning and you have an obligation to yourself to constantly educate yourself as you said reaching out and i think one of the ways that people f can do that is by telling their stories about being uncomfortable, putting themselves in spaces where they may feel uncomfortable, not unsafe, but may feel uncomfortable, so that way they can connect with other people. Well, and everyone's story doesn't have to be your story, and your story doesn't have to be... I mean, I, you know, as I said, I was raised in this extremely, let's just say, uh, monochromatic world. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the first time I started reading s s versions of American history that didn't represent mine, the first time I read Maya Angelou or, or T Toni Morrison, it was jarring for me. And it didn't represent the world that I knew. And it, I had to kind of learn that skill to say, my experience isn't her experience. And she doesn't have to describe the world in an absolute term that I recognize. Like, this is about her experience. And it's about understanding the world that we've built for her and what, what it's like for her to move 
through that world. And it doesn't have to represent your, your view for you to grow and, and really benefit from, from learning how to, how to understand that, how to appreciate it, how to listen. I think what you said at the beginning of this conversation is incredibly important. As people turn away from each other, as they, as they stop listening, um, it doesn't matter necessarily if the person agrees with you on everything or if you think that they think something that is terrible. I think people are more than the worst thing about them. And if you can find that, that center of empathy that, that, that everybody has, I think almost everybody has that, even if they have some wrong view, that's going to be the, the trick. Like, that's going to be the thing. You know, when I went to Cambridge, I had a lot of appalling of views. I had appalling views about gay people. I did. I'd grown up with them. I believed what I'd been told. And I went to Cambridge and was spewing these things. And someone took an entire night and just argued with me about it and just said to me, you seem like a good person. Yeah. Why do you think all of these horrible things? And, and I, I sent him a really awkward email the next morning where I said, so nice to meet you. Thanks for arguing with, this, with me about this. I just want you to know I've thought it over, and I'm wrong, and you're right, and thank you. Because I needed to hear myself say it out loud, and I needed to hear myself say it out loud so that I could know I never want to say this again. Yeah. These aren't my words. They came from somebody else. Mm -hmm. I never want to say this. Yeah. And if someone hadn't talked to me, seen me as a human being, a complete person, and said, I don't know why you think this awful thing, but I think you're more than that, and I'm going to deal with you, I never would have changed my mind. Well, I think that that's the perfect way to conclude this, is that understanding that connecting with other people, taking a moment to empathetically listen to them, to challenge them to grow, is what we can do to share our stories and to make sure that we find common ground. Because we are in a space where at the end of the day, like we started off, we see each other, we love each other, and we really all do want the same thing, which is love. So thank you for sharing your story. Thank you all so much for having us here today. We really appreciate it. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of this day. Thank you, Karama and Tara. What a powerful and necessary conversation. And now, from the dialogues we need to have with each other to the stories we tell ourselves. This past summer, we convened 200 rising leaders from across the African continent. Our next speaker is one of those leaders, the Chief Innovation Officer of Sierra Leone, David Senge here to change the way we think about who exactly can be an innovator. Please welcome David Senge. The story of an entrepreneur, who she is, where she comes from, how she got there, and what in the world she does every day is one that is often told, but yet it is mainly told as a story of exclusion, even if unintentionally. Now, the storyteller is usually a tall male from an Ivy League institution who inherited the genes and the financial gifts from his parents to build a thriving company. Or a middle-class young man who dropped out of high school and spent uncountable hours writing code to make it easier for us all to choose our next meal or date on an app. And sometimes it's a middle-aged woman from a challenging background who is addressing a social problem for thousands of kids who look just like hers. However, as they are told today, these stories make many of us think, well, wow, that was amazing, but I can never do that. It could never be me. I could never be that. As a child growing up in Sierra Leone, I was told that I should want that what I want, and what I should want is to become a medical doctor. Three degrees later from Ivy League institutions and a private sector research experience, I find myself as a data scientist within government, trying to do what many people told me, and continue to tell me every day 
that I am not ready for. As the first chief innovation officer of the Republic of Sierra Leone and a technology and innovation advisor to the presidency, <laughs> thank you. I will tell stories today about how young men and women entrepreneurs on my team are helping the government deliver on its commitments to citizens through code and by engaging with various partners daily. Glenna Wilson, a young database engineer recently recruited from a bank, is working with a small local startup and the country's National Statistics Bureau to build interactive visualization tools to inform national planning and intervention policies. She lives with a grandmother and loves to sing at church on Sundays. Cabinet a reggae musician with four studio albums and a three-year-old boy, builds testing platforms for us to evaluate the technologies we deploy for government services and citizen engagement. For these solutions to work for everyone, they have to function online and offline, on a feature phone or a smartphone, and for some, even when they have no phone credit. And that's exactly what we've done building a simple unit solution that scales algorithmically so it works for everyone. But of course, while we generally expect that innovation is happening within the private sector, we are resigned to expect the opposite in the public sector. Before leaving my job as a manager at IBM Research Africa to join President Bio's government, I was warned that I will stop learning quickly. This advice mostly came from people who love me. But after four months spent building a team who embrace creative freedom and are eager to build solutions that their own kids and parents can benefit from, I have learned more in this period than I could have ever imagined. My team has engaged public financial institutions to develop data architectures that will be compatible for a future driven by edge computing, Internet of Things, and big data analytics. If government is to fully address complex identity challenges, financial inclusion, and security for its citizens, it has to innovate and use state-of-the-art solutions. A couple of weeks ago, um, in a conversation with the vice president, uh, he mentioned to me that he used the results of a machine learning analysis we presented at a cabinet meeting to inform a fiscal intervention by his government. A recent collaboration with the country's vehicle registration agency and the anti-corruption commission has explored how government vehicles were misappropriated over a 10-year period and is identifying the loopholes in current government vehicle ownership policy and transfer methods through data science. Mohamed James, a young computer scientist, and Michael George, a lawyer leading the policy team, closely collaborate on projects like this. And I'm proud to say that Michael is not alone. Uh, over 60% of the data scientists on my team are women. Look, we're not the first ones to have built something like this in government. The United States Digital Services, developed by President Obama, for example, has had tremendous impact. Rwanda, Kenya, Ghana, and many other countries in Africa have developed the space for entrepreneurs, particularly in the private sector, to thrive. That same agility, greed, passion, and play used to learn and develop solutions in the private sector needs to be commonplace in government. And that's what we are on course to do in Sierra Leone. For me, these stories challenge our current understanding of who can and cannot innovate or be an entrepreneur. <clears throat> Excuse me. In my office at State House, I have a set of office principles written on the whiteboard. The first one at the top is, you belong here. The next is, let's get technical. 
Everyone can innovate, and I seek to reaffirm this with my team daily, because we have a chance to make our world more equitable through innovation, particularly in the public sector. We just happen to be starting in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Our next two speakers are leaders on the rise. As members of our community leadership core here in Chicago, they have challenged themselves to build the change they want to see in their city. Emily Nordquist, who you will hear from first, is working to spread financial literacy. And Alex Perez Garcia is battling the stigma around access to mental health care. Please welcome Emily Nordquist. As I sit before a room of 20 young women, I begin to listen as they tell me their experiences with money. I look over at my friend Janae, and she is running around taking photos, and I feel so lucky to have her on my team. Janae is one of those women who doesn't sleep. She works full time, and she's pursuing two master's degrees at night. When I ask her how she possibly finds the time to also support our project in creating spaces for young women to speak candidly about money, she tells me about her 18-year-old niece, Deja. Janae was able to go to college and therefore had access to real financial literacy resources. This is what has allowed her to find the ability to live independently and to explore new careers that are in alignment with her own values. She tells me that it is her personal mission to see to it that her 18-year-old niece will find that same type of freedom. As I listen to her story, I can appreciate how both of our first understandings of money are deeply rooted in both family and identity. For me, I think about how important my dad and my sister were to me when we lost our family business, had to sell our home, and help each other through a remarkably tough time. This feeling of connectedness with Janae is what allows us to talk about finance and allow other young women to do the same in a way that goes far beyond just the numbers. Because we have welcomed vulnerability into the conversation of money, we have been able to meet with 15 community leaders in Chicago and hear from over 30 young women. We've listened to their stories, their fears, their questions, and we've sat together and brainstormed ways in which we can help each other create tools and resources to help young people better understand and talk about money. Unfortunately, this kind of work is hard to find. As young women, we've been told that we don't understand how to manage or invest money, and we don't deserve to make as much of it, and we don't understand enough about it, so we should just step out of the conversation. When we collectively let go of the fear and shame around money, we step into our true power. And when we step into our true power, the world shifts. Thank you. <laughs> Austin, you Chicago student, talented violinist, social justice advocate. Michelle, nonprofit founder, wellness provider, devoted mother. Chris, rap music enthusiast, community leader, strong Southsider. All these beautiful people have been impacted by mental health, yet mental health stigma is the number one reason people of color choose not to seek support sometimes taking up to 10 years. About a month ago, I launched the Beautiful You Project, a digital community around mental health fueled by voices of color. Since launching, we've had over 1,500 views and 1,400 minutes read on our blog and counting. <laughs> This progress is not without setbacks. 
Early on, I felt the dread and fear of failure building inside of me. I wanted to quit, until I looked at my phone and saw I had a message from an old college friend, someone who I hadn't heard from in months. After seeing our work online, she had told me she was going to therapy, and I was the first to know. More messages came since then. A high school friend coming out with her queerness and mental health through art. A teacher trying to communicate with her students in crisis. My own partner, who after many years of hiding, decided he needed help. One thing became very clear. People were listening, people were reading, people were watching. President Obama once said, if you listen hard enough, everybody's got a sacred story. We need to tell our sacred stories, so here's mine. I'm a first-generation Latina living with mental illness. I am a dedicated nonprofit professional. I am beautiful. <laughs> My father told me, Ijita, your parents are fighters. We came alone, and when people tried to put us down, we did not flinch. We stood tall, back straight, chin up. When we spoke, they realized their mistake. In the disability community, we say nothing about us without us. Nada sobre nosotros sin nosotros. Our stories matter, so keep sharing, keep writing, keep going. I get mad at skateboarding like a lot, but at the end of the day, I, I love it so much that I can't stay mad at it. <laughs> but it hurts you. Yeah, so did my dad, but I love him to death. So uh, a lot of people talk about us living in a golden age of documentaries. Um, there's more distributors, more buyers, more viewers than ever, and the viewers are getting younger. That's good for me because I just finished my first feature-length documentary film called Mining the Gap, and people are actually watching it. <laughs> um, I've lived in Chicago for 10 years, and before that, uh, growing up, I didn't you know, being a documentary filmmaker, being a filmmaker didn't seem like a viable option. Um, the city where I grew up in was Rockford, Illinois. That's where Mind in the Gap takes place in. <laughs> There's a couple of Rockford fans out there. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's, it's 90 miles west of Chicago, but it feels a little further than that. There's a lot of cornfields you have to drive through before you get there. Um, and people that know Rockford know that it makes the worst lists highest unemployment, highest rates of violence, highest property taxes. Forbes magazine in 2013 called it the most miserable city to live in in America. Um, yeah, Michael Moore actually came out and did a, a Forbes uh, magazine burning. <laughs> um, Michael Moore, purveyor of Rust Belt cities um, and the pride that it means to live in. And in, in, in a sense, I think you know, people got behind him because it, it doesn't feel miserable to live in a city like this you know, that makes all these worse lists. Um, it can't. It's, it would be exhausting. Um, you know, like, from first-hand experience growing up in a city like Rockford, 
you feel the full range of emotions that we all feel in life and in living it. Um, you know, but that's not to say that people understand that their community needs fixing and you know, there can be progress and there's a lot of work to do. And so there's, there's sort of a tension there between wanting to make your community a better place and feeling like you and your life matters outside of that community. That's the divide that I'm interested in. I think us as filmmakers, we can try to get at that. We can try to bridge that gap. We can try to create osmosis. And in creating shared experiences, and if we do it right in storytelling, it's, it's undeniable. So that's, that's, that's the weight on our shoulders, and I think that's the future of documentary filmmaking in the field. Thank you. Thank you, Bing. That was incredibly moving. And for those of you in the audience who would like to learn more about the film, please do stop by uh, Bing's breakout session. Next up, we have a special treat, a conversation between three of the most inventive and thoughtful contemporary authors working today, Zadie Smith, Yar Jassy, and Courtney Martin. They're here to discuss the power of personal identity. Ya, Zadie, and Courtney, welcome to the stage. Hello. Hello, ladies. Um, so, so many of our audience members are in their 20s, so we thought we would kind of bring you back to our 20s. It's going to be a little easier for Yah than it will be for Zadie and I, who have to look way back. But, um, so, Yah's debut novel, which you should all read if, you have, if you're like the one person who has not read it, is called Homegoing. It's an epic historical <laughs> fiction. There are some people in here who have read it. Thank you. It's gorgeous. Um, it was published in 2016, and she essentially won like every award you could possibly win, well-deserved. Um, she was born in Ghana, the daughter of a professor of French at the University of Alabama and a nurse. And I love this. Anybody remember reading Rainbow? <laughs> yes? So, so her first story ever, she submitted to the Reading Rainbow Young Writers and Illustrators contest and, and won it which encouraged her to be a writer. I'm like, thank I you, Reading win. Rainbow. You didn't win? I didn't I win. thought you won. Oh, I got honorable mentions. So oh. I felt like I won, but I didn't That's I didn't even win. more inspiring <laughs> for the, the writers in the audience who don't win. If you get honorable mention, <laughs> keep writing. Um, and then she's, she's talked about how Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon, which she read in high school, is really like a click moment for her of like, I got to be a writer. Um, and as a massive fan of Toni's, I think that's so beautiful. So. Yeah, you talked about that when you were in college, you went back to Ghana and you visited the Cape Coast Castle, a place where slaves were confined before being shipped to the New World, a place just 50 miles from the town where your mother grew up, right? Um, and you returned home and you said you wrote a single question at the top of your blank computer screen, which was, what does it mean to be black in America? And that that question unfolded into homegoing. Um, why that question? Can you unpack that a little bit for us? Sure. I mean, I think for me, the question was something that had been looming in my mind for many, many years. Um, as you mentioned, I was born in Ghana, um, but we came to America when I was only two. Um, and then from there, we moved around quite a bit. So we lived in Ohio, Illinois, Tennessee, and then Alabama. Um, and in each place, there were fewer and fewer Ghanaians. Um, so in Columbus, Ohio, there, were, there was a large Ghanaian community. I felt I was going to the African Christian church. Like, I still felt very connected to my ethnicity. Um, and then by the time we got to Alabama, there were very few in the part of town that we lived in, um, very few black people in the part of town that we lived in. Um, and so suddenly I was kind of faced with this question of how to, I guess, balance or navigate my race and my ethnicity. Um, and so for me, going to Ghana, taking that trip, um, trying to understand the ways in which Ghanaian history and American history connected, um, for me was a, a way to kind of open up this question of what it meant to be black in America. That's amazing. I kept thinking when I was reading it, so to give you perspective, it's, it's descendants of this one woman that branch into two families 
and it's linked short stories of many, many, many generations from slavery until contemporary America. And I kept imagining you in writing classes, like 20 whatever years old, saying, I'm going to write this epic novel that is, you know, like explaining it to a teacher and having the professor, whether subtly or not so subtly, be like, oh, girl, like you need to pick a way less complicated yeah. first novel. <laughs> yeah. But I kept wondering, like, what allowed you to hold on to that epic vision? Which also I was thinking about the gender and race implications. Like, the, the epic novels are often written by, like, young, overly confident white dudes, right? <laughs> like, and you wrote, you successfully achieved this gorgeous huge novel as a first novel. Like, did you have to squash a lot of haters and like not listen to a lot of professors <laughs> that told you not to write something that big that, right out of the gates? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think part of the task in the beginning was not just squashing the haters, but also squashing that voice inside of yourself that says, this is stupid, this is impossible, why are you even trying? Um, because, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because if you're, if you're not willing to fail at something epically, then you will never be able to write something epic, you know? And so I think having that reminder um, for myself was really helpful. And then sticking to the research um, and understanding that I was kind of um, uh, attempting to tell the stories of, of these people who had really existed. Obviously, the, the novel is fiction, but every time I read an account of what somebody had gone through in these time periods that I was writing about, I felt as though I had to, I would do them a disservice if I didn't try at least to get this book right. Wow, that's awesome. I'm so glad you didn't listen to those, <laughs> those voices. Um, Zadie, you had success at a very early age also. I, I like, couldn't believe this when I read it, you wrote White Teeth at 23 years old. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, it was published when I was 23, yeah. So you really wrote it when you were earlier, yeah. yeah. How yeah. can that be? I mean, that's amazing. So, like, since then, let's just put in perspective for Zadie's career. She's published seven books, five novels, two essay collections, also won every imaginable award, maybe not the one from LeVar Burton and Reading Rainbow, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but every other award that you can win. Um, become an icon of sorts. When you look back at that book, White Teeth, and at this 22-year-old writing, did you have like a driving question at the top of your computer screen, I mean, metaphorically speaking, like, yeah? Yes, I, abs I absolutely identified with um, Yah's question. I, I think, actually, uh, it sometimes un underplayed the sense that when you're writing, you're not, um, for me anyway, it wasn't about uh, describing myself and my identity, it, it was genuinely a question. I, I guess the question in my house was, how did these people come to be married? <laughs> Which is a question perhaps everybody asks of their parents, but in my case it was a, a very long question. <laughs> yes. Why, why, why does a, a woman from Jamaica, from the diaspora, how did she meet this uh, working class white man from an equally long ancestry in a different place? Um, and then that question expanded to, uh, you know, why are there Bengalis next door? Why are there Poles? Why the Irish? Why this Jewish family? I, I grew up in this incredibly mixed environment, in this mixed school. So everything was questions and also um, deep voyeurism. You know, I really wanted to know what was going on in all the houses next door, all the flats <laughs> next door. I was really um, fascinated by other lives, you know. Mm -hmm. But why did that fascination manifest in fiction form? I mean, did you think about investigating it in other ways, or were you always drawn to fiction? It, it's such a strange form, because it really is uh, uh, lying to tell the truth, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like, that, there is no way... When I read Yar's book, uh, first of all, I felt I wish I'd had that book when I was 15. It's one of my strongest feelings about that book. It was a book that I had wanted to read my whole life. But, but the rightness of it is not the rightness of history or, you know, it's not, it's the rightness that you feel in your gut, which is very hard to uh, quantify. Why, when I read one book about, you know, the history of diaspora, do I feel this is right and another book might feel false or... Mm. That there's no guarantee in that sense and it's, it's full of risk. No matter how much research you do, you can't do research into humans, not, not really. So it, when I was writing about all these people, the risk is always... Well, what do you know about the Bangladeshi family next door? And what do you know, in fact, about your own mother? And what do you know, even know about yourself? It's not uh, rocket science. Mm. It's this emotional content. Um, and all you can do is um, 
feel your way through it, you know. And research helps for sure, right? Yeah. You, you have facts, you have historical details, but um, the rightness or wrongness of a page is always a massive risk. Mm -hmm. Every page is a risk, because at any point the reader is free to say, no, right. I don't agree, I don't feel this, it, this isn't my life, it doesn't represent me. And so that risk is what I'm addicted to, in fact. Mm. Um, the possibility of being wrong so many ways all the time, for some reason, is a great <laughs> thrill to me. <laughs> <laughs> You're a thrill seeker. So, yeah. did you have a, a, the equivalent of a Song of Solomon, like something you read? Well, early actually, on to be boring, it was also the Song of Solomon. <laughs> um, but uh, maybe a, a bit stronger for me um, was Alice Walker uh, and The Color Purple, mm -hmm. um, just because I don't know why it had a stronger impression on me, and I was younger when I read it, probably. Um, and then, of course, all the other writers. I was, I was brought up in, a, in England, so I was reading. Dickens, Roald Dahl, Shakespeare, you know, it, it's a massive canvas of reading, you know. Mm -hmm. Some of it which was close to me and some of which couldn't be further away, but meant as much. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sure that's a, a beautiful thing to hear that your book had an influence on Zadie. Yeah. Did you have an audience in mind when you were writing or did you have to sort of banish the notion of who anyone's actually going to read this in order to take that leap of faith to get it done? Well, I mean, what Zadie said about wishing that she had had this book when she was 15, I think that's, that's always my target audience, you know, is myself at 15, the book that I would have wanted to read, the mm -hmm. book that I wish um, that I had been able to see myself in. Um, I'm going to butcher the Toni Morrison quote, but she says something like, um, if you are looking on your bookshelf for a book and you can't find it, you have to write it. Mm -hmm. um, and I really took that mandate to heart, you know. Um, I, I had never seen myself in fiction, um, and, I, and I read so voraciously as a child that the fact that, you know, I was able to, um, you know, find commonalities with, with these characters who were completely different from me was also exciting, and it means that I think that fiction does its work, that it, like, allows us to um, feel empathy for lots of different people, and yet still, I, I craved a story that, um, that I myself, uh, as, the, as a middle schooler, as a high schooler, would have, would have wanted to see. And have you been surprised by who has responded to the novel? Have there been any s interesting reactions that you were like, well, that's not who I wrote it for, but great, <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, I think anytime anybody has told me that they've read the book, I, I feel that, you know? <laughs> um, because writing, writing a novel, I think of it as, um, you know, you're kind of working in the dark for so many years, uncertain of whether or not your book will ever come to light. Mm -hmm. um, and so the fact that this book has come to light and that the light has been so bright um, and that so many wonderful people have, um, have read it and, and gotten something out of it, I'm astonished every time. That's yeah. beautiful. Um, Zadie, in your most recent book of essays, you write, my hope is for a reader who, like the author, wonders how free she really is, which I love. What do you mean by that? What I'm wondering when I'm writing is whether it's possible to, to um, create a citizen or, or a, a civilian, a non-writer, who, th who thinks as a writer does about identity. I guess that's what interests me. Mm. Like, when I was a reader, like Ya, yeah, I was reading all kinds of books by necessity with people in them who were nothing, supposedly nothing like me. Yet when I read Madame Bovary, I thought, I too am Madame Bovary. When I read uh, Tolstoy's Ivan Ilyevich, I thought, I too am Ivan Ilyevich. And that's the experience of minority readers all the time, this identification across supposed boundaries. What I'm trying to do is encourage people in the other direction. So if somebody's reading Swing Time and they're reading about a little black girl in London, I don't want that identification to be at a distance, like, oh, look at this interesting exotic story of this person. I want them to identify the way I did, mm. wholly, body and soul, no matter what they happen to look like, no matter what their particular background, that's the exercise. Mm -hmm. That you place yourself in this person's life, not as a minority interest, not a, as a, oh, I wonder how they live. This is your life mm. for the duration of this book. Mm. This is your life, you live in it, the way I lived in your books. And that kind of exchange is important to me. Um, and, and also, I guess, you know, as a person who feels that, uh, identity is real and also um, constructed. I'm interested in uh, coalition across difference, you know? That's, that's the story of my life, the mm -hmm. story of my family and, and 
partially the story of my country. So I, I'm trying to make people step into this girl's life as if it were their life. That matters to me. That takes a, a real generosity of a reader too, right? To believe that they will go the full way as opposed to this more sort of objectifying reception or read. And right. one of the things I've been thinking about with b both of your work is that novels allow for this multiplicity of characterization, like this nuance, and that's very present in the, both of your work. And I, as someone who's trained as a journalist, I think one of our huge failures at this moment has been creating so much dualistic narration about who people are and who represents a country, et cetera, whereas you all are able to, to encompass so much nuance in the characters that you're portraying. Do you feel like, is, for, for like the regular people in the audience, like, do we actually have that failure of imagination about other people, or is that a representation of journalism? Do you know what I mean? It's like, people read your novels and love them, and yet then we go out and have all of these <laughs> like, incredibly reductive ideas about each other. Is that a failure of human nature, a fail of failure of journalism? Like, I'm just trying to unpack why we seem so bad at nuance in, the, in these, this moment in particular. I, th I think uh, fiction's wonderful, obviously, but there's, it's hard to find a substitute f for experience, you know? Um, and in my experience, we're talking backstage about the kind of um, housing estate or project, as you call it, that I grew up on was, was uh, class-wise, united, but race-wise, completely mixed. So when you live in this kind of coalition space of black people, Indian people, Pakistani people, Irish people, it's not that your lives are point for point exactly the same, but there are points of connection that you can communicate across. And you get used to the idea that perfect alignment doesn't have to exist in order for communication to happen. Right. And that's my assumption. What's happening at the moment, I think, is that Unless the alignment is perfect, it's, it's considered as if no conversation can happen. But it can happen. It might be clumsy, it might be awkward, it might be embarrassing, it might make you angry sometimes. It's still possible. Right. And there are things that you have in common structurally, in my case, in our housing estate, the fact that we were all poor, <laughs> that's, that is a coalition in itself. Mm -hmm. So I, I think in fiction that becomes much easier to do in life. We bristle a little bit, no? If your story is not my story, how can we, how can we speak? Right. Do you and feel think, that way, yeah? Yeah, I think what fiction does in part, too, is that it takes away, um, it takes away this wall so that you're not, as Zadie was mentioning, you're not becoming this kind of voyeur looking at this other person. You, if, if the fiction is done well, you feel as though you are actually living the experiences of these characters. You get to kind of follow their thoughts and feelings, and so in, in a way they become your thoughts and feelings just for that moment that you're reading the book. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that exercise of, uh, of walking in other people's shoes um, rather than kind of seeing them, uh, watching them, but feeling as though you have become them um, is the thing that when I read, that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking for. Right. Well, and in, especially in the case of homegoing, you have such a macro and a micro thing going on because you're getting these generations and these sweeps of history of context, but then you're getting these tiny details. I mean, I, I, can, I can bring to mind different characters and these like tiny moments that made me empathize with them, whereas a lot of the media we're consuming is so flat and so fast and doesn't contain that kind of macro and micro, right? So I think part of it is a time thing. Yeah. Right? Does that yes. make sense? Sure. Yeah. And, and what you said about fast and flat, fiction takes forever, you know? Yeah. It can take, homegoing took me seven years. Um, and so I'm, I was able to kind of imbue that sense of, of macro and micro because I was thinking about it so deeply for so long. And I think if, um, if you're writing and reading things very quickly off the cuff, you don't always get that, that second layer, that third layer, that fourth layer. Yeah. Um, last year at the summit, I got to interview this amazing woman, Adrienne Marie Brown, who's an organizer and a writer, and she said that basically all community organizing is speculative fiction, because you have to so, imagine the world idea. that you're trying right. to build into. Um, and I thought of her when I was reading your work and preparing for this, and I just wondered if you'd talk about what you see as the role of the novelist at this really contentious moment where a lot of us are feeling very heartbroken and kind of turning to media, turning to different, you know, activist endeavors, but tr sort of trying to find ourselves in all of this. I think for me, when I'm, the mode I write in is the idea that 
I know this is in some ways opposite to a lot of what we've heard while we're here, is that my own story is in some ways, for me, the one I'm least engaged with. I don't know how to put it. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm writing my novels, I know that sometimes there are characters who seem physically like me or structurally in the same position as me. But the problem with yourself is that you're you're so subjective about yourself. Right. And sometimes I'm the person I see least, you know. Right. Whereas when I wrote White Teeth, the people I were really engaged with were, was everybody else. Right. A kind of fascination, a love, and a curiosity. And I think in terms of community organizing, that seems to me so essential that, of course, yourself is important in your identity, but what you're there for are these others. It's trying to understand, ask questions. What's your life like? How does it feel? What are you doing? That extension away from yourself into other people is what maybe fiction could could model as a kind of citizen citizenship behavior right the idea that yourself is great but it's just the start of a much broader story so the practice of curiosity the practice and of curiosity and of being radically involved in other people's lives and yeah. caring about them yeah <laughs> yeah do you have have thoughts about the novelist role? Because it's, it's interesting, you said it takes you seven years. Like, that's a lot of years of being, you know, sitting in front of a computer, and I'm sure there are moments of thinking, like, is this relevant? Is this, you know, in these fast-moving times? Yeah. How do you think about your work in context of everything that's going on? Well, I was, I was really grateful for the, for the slowness of writing Homegoing because it meant that I was able to kind of, um, the world was changing around me, but I was able to kind of understand um, why the questions that were important to me were questions that do always matter to the wider world. Um, so I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about Ghanaian history, I was thinking about American history, I was thinking about identity, um, and, and some of the things that came up in the book um, at the time that I was writing it didn't feel particularly relevant to the world that at that moment, and yet when the book came out, um, seemed extremely relevant. And so that, that understanding that um, our curiosities uh, are important. Um, I think that's that's something that that uh, that novelists um, can can be aware of and can kind of help um, help us see. I love that. Um, I also feel like both of you. I mean, curiosity to its most granular form is questions. Right? Learn how to ask really good questions. Stop talking so much. Right? Could be a good lesson for all of us right now. Um, and and you talked about that your novel came from a question. Um, I know you're just working on your second novel. Is there a new question at the top of the blank screen these days that's driving you that you can share? Um, not as not as direct as with Homegoing, but um, it is still it is still driven by questions. I think um, what I'm always attempting to do in my work is to feel as though I'm being deeply interrogative. And so if if I I can't name a specific question for the next book, but um, that desire to continue kind of um, interrogating my own thoughts and, and my mind is, is hopefully something that will be apparent on the page. I can't wait to read it. Um, Zadie, do you have a question at the top of your metaphorical screen these days, or a few of them? It's, it's weird. I, I fin just finished a book, and it actually has an epigraph, which is a question, so that's strange. Yeah, that there you it's, go. Uh, it's, it's Frank O'Hara, how can a person fail to be? I mm. thought that was a really interesting question. In, in what ways can you genuinely fail to be human, you know, to act like a human, to consider other humans? I, I wouldn't have thought that was possible a while ago, but now I, I realize it is. Like, being human isn't just a, a, a thing you're born with. You kind of have to earn it, you know? It's, it's, it's actually a, a big deal. <laughs> um, and there's loads of ways you can, you can fail to, to be a full person. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was putting that question to myself, you know, in what ways do I, do I fail every day to, to honor this thing of the human, which to me is kind of a big deal. Wow, that's so beautiful. Is that nonfiction or fiction? It's stories, short stories. It's short stories. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, I can't wait to keep reading both of you. I feel so grateful for your work and the way you move through the world. And let's all keep attempting to earn to be human here in our, in our time together. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you, Yar, Zedi, and Courtney for that stirring discussion. 
Hearing those voices is difficult to top, so instead, our next speaker will implore us to open our eyes. Melissa Kill Malskoon is an Obama fellow who creates digital storybooks so that deaf children can grow up with the same rich exposure to language that many of us take for granted. Please raise your hands and wave with me to welcome Melissa to the stage. Hello, everyone. I come from a family of storytellers, deaf storytellers. I'm third generation deaf. And what that really means is that from the moment I was born, as soon as my eyes opened, I had a world of language presented to me. I had access to sign language and that's an integral part of who I am. I'm also only part of 5% of the deaf community, so I'm a minority within a minority. This 5% of deaf people was born to deaf parents. So let me tell you a little bit about my grandfather. He's well regarded in the deaf community. He's looked up to as a master of our language, a master storyteller. When he went to college, he chose Gallaudet University because it was and is the only university in the world that was established primarily for deaf students. When he was a student, they had a literary competition. And my grandfather entered it, and of course he wanted to win. So he thought long and hard about what the most challenging poem would be that he could use in this competition he found something absolutely absurd. He chose Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll. The poem is absolutely nonsensical. It's full of language play. And he said, well, why can't I do the same thing in sign language and bring these images out in sign? So he did it. He told that poem and absolutely brought all of Carol's images to life so vividly that the audience was stunned. It was groundbreaking because nobody had ever seen that done with their language. This was in the 1940s. And at the time, Nobody thought that sign language was a real language like any other spoken language. When my grandfather was in college, it wasn't a language, but by the time my parents were college students, it was on the verge of being recognized that way. And then I had grown up in a world where it had already been recognized as a language. But in my grandfather's day, deaf people were ashamed of signing. But when my grandfather told that poem, it opened people's eyes to a world in which language play was possible. He, they understood that sign language could be used to share and tell stories. And had his story not been documented through film, it would have disappeared. Film is how we document and preserve our stories. It's how we carry on our values and our knowledge to future generations. My grandfather has since passed on, but his original Jabberwocky has inspired new Jabberwockies. Now, remember I said I'm part of just 5%? What's life like for the remaining 95%? The other 95% of deaf people are born into hearing families, which mean they aren't born into families where they have immediate access to sign language. Early access to sign language in those first few years of life are so critical. Having no language access from birth to five 
means you're being deprived of language. And language deprivation has lifelong consequences. It creates cognitive delays, which lead to academic struggles and struggles in adulthood, all because of having a weak foundation from early childhood. And this is happening all over the world, including in the United States. Access to language is a basic human right. So why is this such a complicated problem? Because families who find out that their child are deaf are not connected to resources. When they find out their child is deaf, they go through a grieving process, they're often confused, and they're given misinformation. They feel so disconnected from communities. But with language, we can create human connections. So I'm here to let you know that we have resources. We have a wealth of resources in the deaf, we have a wealth of resources in the deaf community. For example, we have a movement that's taking place through social media with the hashtag why I sign. It encourages families to use sign language with each other and with their deaf children to connect as family members. My siblings and a friend of mine created an app called the ASL app, which was designed to teach conversational phrases in ASL. Our intent in making the app was to connect communities. Learning just a few signs opens up doors to new worlds and new people. I want to see all doors everywhere opened for connection. I also created the Motion Light Lab, where we integrate creative literature and digital technologies to create immersive learning experiences. Pretty awesome, right? I also led the development of a storytelling tool that allows anyone to create bilingual storybook apps. That's what we do. We create apps that make stories available in a signed language and a written language. And it's this work that has transformed how we think of reading. Our apps give the opportunity for deaf children to learn to read to see a story told in a signed language and make connections to the printed word. These apps also support their literacy development. And not only that, they also encourage families to learn to sign. As families navigate this new world, they can use these apps to share stories with their children and sign along with the stories and share that love of our stories and our traditions that are so needed in connecting us. So how do we make these apps? In every case, we've assembled a team of talented deaf artists in the community. We have storytellers, illustrators, videographers, we create these teams entirely of deaf people because we are a solution to this problem. We also train and teach and invest in the digital skills of these talents in the deaf community. This ability is power. It creates the ability to document our visual language and tell our stories, which is representation. Our work not only benefits a deaf child, it benefits communities. With this expansion in literature, having literature available in both signed languages and written languages, it expands our views on the world. Everyone's view on the world. This then in turn allows creation, connections with people in other countries. I've worked with deaf people in 11 other countries. We've translated them into 11 sign languages because sign language is not universal. Every country has their own sign language. In doing all of this international work, we have found folk tales and folklore that is traditionally only passed down through oral means, and we've made these stories come alive for deaf children. 
celebrating our humanity and our human diversity, as well as our cultures in an inclusive way. Storytelling gifts from my grandfather that have been passed down to my family and to me are now being passed down to my son. I adopted my son when he was four years old, and at the time he had had no exposure to language. I understood language deprivation in new ways because it was up close and personal in my own home. So my deaf son, now after two years of having lots of love and language input and stories, has now absolutely blossomed. And now he's telling us stories. Access to language means access to stories. And that's the power of stories. Stories create who we are. They create our ways of understanding the world. They create ways of understanding our shared humanity. Stories connect us. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. That was profound. And that brings us to the close of this morning's session. I want to offer a huge thank you to our remarkable speakers. Each and every one of you gave us a new way to think about how we might use storytelling in our work to heal, bond, gather, and act. But even a great story needs a pause in the action. For those on the live stream, we'll be picking things back up at 3.15, and of course, that's Chicago time. So until then. And for those of us in the room, our next move will be to the first block of breakouts. Please consult the app or the breakout guide to find which room you'll be heading to next. Thank you all. <laughs>